Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rita Konaev, and I'm the Deputy Director of Analysis here at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology. As I'm sure many of you know, there is a great deal of attention that is being paid today to how the United States can slow down the technological advancement of our competitors with a big focus on China through policies like export controls, investment screenings, and other similar initiatives and measures. But today at this webinar, we would like to focus on how the United States can run faster in order to outpace those competitors by promoting US innovation and economic progress here at home, focusing on issues like developing technological talent and the workforce that we're going to need to lead in emerging technologies, developing a comprehensive industrial policies and promoting a supportive regulatory environment as well as ensuring that our defense establishment and our def uh, national security ecosystem can remain on the cutting edge of innovation and it is well positioned to adopt new and emerging technologies safely and responsibly. In a minute, I'm going to break out our panel of experts, our panel of experts here from CSET, in order to outline some of the measures that the United States can take in order to reach these goals. But first, let me go through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, all of the attendees' uh, microphones right now are muted. If you are on a computer and you're experiencing any technical issues, you can use the chat function below at the bottom of your screen to let us know, and somebody from CSET will try to help you. Our goal here today is to have an open and engaging dialogue and a conversation. So as questions come to mind, or if you have comments that you want to raise, please use our, the chat function to let us know. And we will be you know, engaging those questions and answering them as the conversation develops. And with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce our panelists today. Ali Crawford is a research analyst here at CSET's Hyper AI Project. And she's working on topics like cyber talent programs, um, and education and workforce development. Emmy Probasco is a senior fellow who is leading our military applications of artificial intelligence line of research. And finally, Jack Corrigan is a senior research analyst who is working on understanding the domestic innovation ecosystem and the policy levers that can be used to strengthen it. Thank you, Ali, Emmy, and Jack for joining the conversation here today. I would like to start by asking all three of you the same question. When you are looking at your areas of research, what is the most exciting thing that you are seeing in terms of boosting US and allied innovation, especially in artificial intelligence and in related technologies? Ali, I think we'll start with you. Great, thanks Rita so much. Um, and first let me say it is such an honor to be here with my colleagues today and with our audience as well. So there are actually two things that are really exciting for me to see. You know, most of my work up until this point with CSET has focused on areas that I feel are underexplored or overlooked efforts to either produce cyber, AI, and STEM talent, or to incentivize innovation. And so uh, given the theme of today's webinar, I'll start with that. So it's really encouraging for me to see federal departments and agencies continue to use prize competitions to tackle really big goals in tech innovation. Um, and just so we're all on the same page, federal prize competitions are challenges or contests that uh, are sponsored by federal departments, agencies, offices that use monetary and non-monetary incentives to encourage innovation, um, particularly in areas of national security importance, but also, uh, maybe in areas where the private sector is uh, less incentivized. In fact, the recent 2023 update of the National AI Research and Development Strategic Plan sees competitions as one method for improving, enlarging, and creating mechanisms for research and development partnerships. And that's one reason why I'm excited about them, because they have unique benefits that are less easily replicated through some traditional R&D processes. I'm happy to talk more about that later. But, you know, innovation also requires talent and education is what produces talent. In fact, in its final report, the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence really urges the nation to prioritize investments in STEM education 
um, largely based on their assessment that the US education system is not uh, sufficiently producing talent to meet that demand. And so one program I've been focusing on lately is the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Federal Scholarship for Service Program, which is a direct talent pipeline into the federal cyber workforce. And given its longevity, you know, it's been around for about two decades now, I think understanding what's working for that program, but also what's not working for that program, will really help to inform a future AI federal scholarship for service. The uh, Chips and Science Act of 2023 um, directed the uh, National Science Foundation to conduct a feasibility study to assess whether a separate and standalone AI scholarship for service program might be both necessary and beneficial to meet federal AI talent demands. And so I would be happy to talk more about talent pipeline programs, others like it, um, larger trends in computer science, cyber and AI education, and of course, our theme of the day, federal prize competitions and, and the power uh, that they have for innovation. Sweet, and I could just, uh, I'll jump in. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, I think when I kind of look out at the policy landscape, there there's really two areas that that I'm really interested in right now. Um, I think the first is kind of this uh, renewed focus on industrial policy. So as I'm sure many of the folks on this call know, the, the public sector has historically played like a really big role in, in driving technological innovation. Um, you see big inventions of the 20th century, like, like GPS and the internet kind of came directly out of uh, government R&D programs. Uh, you've seen the government historically um, played more indirect roles in supporting industries. So the, the semiconductor industry, for instance, um, was really able to, to, to take root in the 50s and 60s due to government purchases of chips for, for NASA and for the Air Force. Um, industrial policy kind of fell out of fashion, but now we're, we're seeing this kind of resurgence now around um, different uh, strategic technologies like like chips and um uh green and clean energy um so yes yeah, so obviously so the two kind of the two big policy examples of the chips act the ira which, which focused on this green energy transition um and i think what i found most interesting about these policies are they really recognize the kind of multifaceted um factors within the innovation ecosystem so obviously having um disposable capital for these corporations is very important um, but within both of these programs, we also see a big focus on workforce issues, um, as Ali spoke to, um, and we see a big focus on developing kind of these geographic tech hubs. And I think that's that's particularly interesting for me. I think having these kinds of concentrations of resources and infrastructure and talent and know-how is really important to kind of driving innovation. And we saw, at least in the CHIPS Act, uh, $10 billion go to kind of building these, these innovation hubs. Um, with these two policies, there's obviously still a lot of open questions about the specific objectives that we're trying to achieve and whether the, the funding that we've allocated so far is enough to, to get there. Um, but I think that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the action that we've seen here has been very promising. Um, one thing I'll just add on that is that a lot of this industrial policy has focused on um, primarily on funding, um, but the government has a wide variety of policy levers at its disposal for Kind of creating these innovation ecosystems and, and really driving technology forward. Um, competition policy being one of them, procurement being another. Happy to talk more about this in the Q&A. Um, and then kind of the second area that that I've been particularly interested in recently is, is this um, these growing calls for, for regulating artificial intelligence. Um, anyone, a lot of the people in this space know that these conversations have kind of been brewing in the background for a very long time. Um, and then the, you know, the, the popularity of, of generative AI tools like ChatGPT really brought them to the fore. But I think that, you know, now we're starting to see policymakers, again, recognizing their role in, in shaping the trajectory of, of a new emerging technology. Um, one thing that we're interested in here at CSET is looking at different regulatory frameworks. So kind of more decentralized approaches versus centralized approaches and some of the strengths and weaknesses of both of those. Um, Happy to talk more about that in the Q and A, but uh, I think um, you know one thing I'll just add is that you know we're not guaranteed to see action here. Um, there was a lot of conversations about regulating social media companies over the last few years, and we didn't see a whole lot come out of Congress related to that. But um, I'm not in the the prediction business, but I think that given the given the the breadth of the AI field and all of the various ways that it will impact our lives and the way that we you know work live. Um, I'm a little more optimistic that we might see some action on, on, on regulating the tech, but um, again, yeah, just happy to happy to talk more about that in the Q and A. 
Yeah. And I think I'll just pile on to Jack and Allie because so much of what they talked about feeds into some of the exciting stuff going on in terms of the national security applications of artificial intelligence. Um, you've got everything that they talked about, but then you've also got the extra added impetus of everyone's watching what's happening in, in Ukraine, trying to understand what that might mean for the way the U.S. might fight. And then there's the increasing concern about deterring or otherwise fighting China. So you take that kind of real world context and now mix it with uh, what seems to be coming to fruition, the decades of investment in AI and ML, autonomy, robotics. These things are coming together in such a way that they're getting produced and they're usable in the field. So we, we sort of see those things coming together at the same time that what for me is most exciting is you've got a top-down innovation push and a bottoms-up innovation push happening in the department right now. You've got you know, top-down sorts of examples. You can see Defense Innovation Unit has been elevated to report directly to the Secretary of Defense and has a brand new director with a really exciting background. You've got the Deputy Secretary's announcement two weeks ago about the Replicator program and this ambitious goal to buy thousands of drones in 18 to 24 months. And then you've got this proliferation in the fleet, um, in the COCOM, sorry, with innovation units. So you've got the Task Force 59, and you've also got Admiral Aquilino's announcement uh, just two weeks ago about the Joint Mission Accelerator Directorate. So the COCOMs are starting to, the leadership is giving room and space for people to innovate out at the COCOM level. At the same time, the thing that makes me probably the most excited is that when I look around, we're seeing visionary leaders come out around the Department of Defense who are leading experimentation and showing what could potentially be done. The people that you've probably heard about are like the Mike Pursers or the Shiler Moores out at CENTCOM, but you've also got really exciting folks like Joe Callahan, who works with the 18th Airborne on the Thousand Decisions Scarlet Dragon work. So these, these individuals are being given the room and the space to experiment with technology that's really starting to work. It seems like we might be at the edge of scaling for the Department of Defense, but you know, I'm, I'll be hesitant there. I don't think it's systemic just yet, but we are starting to see um, space for those leaders. The With all of this happening and starting to scale, I think um, it can feel a little cacophonous. It's a little crazy with all these defense innovation initiatives. Uh, that, in my mind, is not necessarily a bad thing. That's kind of how innovation happens. If it was smooth and easy, we probably would be doing it wrong. The one place where I'd say um, we might want to take a pause to get in sync because it'll help us innovate faster is around these concepts of trustworthy, reliable, and ethical AI. Um, what is great is that everybody's talking about it. People clearly care about it. It's a part of the regulation conversation. It's happening uh, domestically as well as internationally. That's all fantastic. It's even so good that many people are using the same words, explainability, accuracy, transparency, bias. But what's concerning to me is that even if you look at within the domestic arena, we are using the same words, but we use them in a slightly different way. We define them in different ways. The easiest way to see this is if you look at um, the Department of Commerce's National Institute of, Strat of um, Standards and Technology put out the AI RMF about a year ago. It's a great document if you haven't read it. It really, it, the process by which they came to define these terms with, with industry and international partners was great. But if you compare their list of terms and those definitions to the DOD's list of terms and definitions, they're off. They don't quite match up. And while at first that might seem kind of academic, oh, they didn't define their terms, well, it becomes a problem down the line when the DOD is trying to buy things from industry and industry is using NIST terms, they're not using the DOD terms. It's also a problem when DOD wants to innovate with its partners and allies around the world, and they also have a different sense of what transparency, privacy, those sorts of things mean. So I think taking a little bit of a pause to make sure we're in sync on those key principles we understand what they mean, could help us innovate even faster and really grab this momentum that seems to be around the department. Thank you. These are really important and interesting points to start the conversation. And once again, I want to encourage our participants to participate and contribute into the chat. And we're really uh, you know, looking forward to engaging some of the thoughts and questions that you have. So let me start by drawing on some of the questions that we're already getting. And Emmy, you mentioned procurement and buying things. You cannot innovate without the ability to buy things quickly. 
And I would be remiss not to ask, uh, what are some evolutions that you are seeing in terms of uh, procurement changes, perhaps reforms um, that are, you know, happening throughout DOD that can help us run faster? And where do you think there are still outstanding gaps, challenges, barriers uh, that we still need to be working through? Yeah, so um, it's hard to answer this question succinctly uh, and, and comprehensively, so I, I won't even try. But I will say that we have seen evidence of, um, if you take your DIUs, for example, one of the major innovations of DIU was the use of other transactional authorities and really showing people the way how to use that in order to acquire more quickly and also creating new pipelines so that uh, folks that were out in the field could access technologies that DIU had had identified. You've also got places like AFWorks that exists in a slightly different part of the ecosystem where they're working with SIBRs and STTRs, and how do you use that for really early stage kinds of research? Um, and then I've even seen really interesting um, uses of BAAs uh, to try and find ways to agile, you know, sort of do agile development and particularly in terms of software. And that's something we're trying to understand better. But looking at the full scope of outside, there's program of record, obviously that's the big one. Um, but knitting those all together so that we can create that pipeline that crosses the valley of death, it seems like we've got a lot more experimentation and also sharing of different ways of getting at it. I hope that answers your question, Rita. I mean, that's a question that we can have an entire webinar for and, you know, an entire career dedicated solely to that. But that's those are really uh, helpful insights. Thank you. Ali, you mentioned that talent is really the key to everything. And I think you're absolutely right. And I'm pretty sure that everyone here would agree with you. When you're looking at some of the work that you've done in understanding the cyber talent pipeline, especially those NSF initiatives that you mentioned. What are some good lessons that can be drawn from it? What have been some success stories that you think would be applicable for AI? Yeah, that, I love that question because this project has really been a passion project of mine. And so first of all, that feasibility study that I mentioned, I think there's a, a year a timeline on that and they're kind of approaching that. And so essentially how I see, so, some, some of the work that I've done with CyberCore and the implications for an AI scholarship for service program. First, I see that the AI scholarship for service program, if it's determined there is a need for it, the most important thing here is to clearly define like the program structure. And so it's not entirely clear how this potential program might be structured. So for example, if it were to operate entirely identical to CyberCore, then it is imperative that program managers should decide upon the programs, the AI program's goals to and purpose to avoid duplication. And what I mean by that is AI as a distinct college major is relatively a relatively new academic pursuit. But I think that there could be some overlap between what CyberCore is doing and what the uh, an AI SFS might be doing. And so the, the thing is, there's fields of study that are obviously not differentiated from CyberCore fields of study, and so there's likely going to be some overlap there. Um, the other thing to consider, too, is what is the primary goal of the program, right? So in CyberCore, we know the primary goal of the program is federal employment, but there are alternative pathways as well. So they're, they're capped, but um, CyberCore recipients can go state, local, tribal, territorial. They can uh, go to uh, nationally funded research centers, um, and they can also return to academia, although all those pathways are significantly capped. And so I think if the AI Scholarship for Service primary goal was to be federal employment, then the program manager may want to exclude some of those alternative pathways as well. Um, and of course, an assessment of the federal demand for AI talent must also include an analysis of what is the average education level of the current federal AI workforce plus the desired education level and general skills of future employees too. I know one problem that CyberCore is running into now is there's lots of calls for expansion, but there's a variety of different ways where you could expand. And so one thing that I've run into in my work is um, 
the institutions that are involved in, in the Cyber Corps program very strongly believe that the program should be expanded to be more inclusive of PhD candidates, right? And you would think that's a really good thing, but the problem is we don't really know the demand on the federal side for cy uh, cyber PhDs. And so is there really a need to expand the program to include more PhD talent is a question that Cyber Corps is grappling with. And I would imagine that the AI program would grapple with as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, aligning the question of supply and demand is going to be a challenge, obviously, not just for the cyber workforce, but the AI workforce as well. And what you mentioned is obviously focused predominantly on the federal workforce, but I'd be remiss not to say that CSET is also exploring a new project that is going to be looking at apprenticeships and trying to think about how do we help develop a workforce that goes into the private sector and is prepared to take on some of those you know, incredible opportunities that are coming to fore in the field of AI with investments such as the CHIPS Act and all the good jobs that will hopefully uh, you know, come out of those initiatives. Uh, as we're thinking about you know, US innovation, there is the inevitable tension that people see between investing in innovation and focusing and promoting innovation and on the one hand, and uh, necessary regulations on artificial intelligence, or at least what I personally think are necessary um, regulations on artificial intelligence. I'm gonna open this question to everybody, so please chime in as you see fit. What are some of those tensions that you see between investing in innovation and making sure that we're also promoting responsible regulations? And the second part to that question is, when we're thinking about steps that we're taking in-house uh, in order to promote certain regulations and enforce them, are we putting ourselves at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis our competitors that perhaps are not thinking about regulating AI in the same way and are perhaps not as restricted by some of the uh, guardrails that we want to put on ourselves? I could, I could take a stab at that first. Um, I think, yeah, well, first, I'll just say at a very high level, I think that um, it is important to recognize that there is a tension here. Um, we did a I did a paper with um, our director, Dewey Murdoch, a few months ago, kind of looking at some of these broad tensions in, in um, tech and national security policy. This is like the core one. Um, and I, I think that, you know, if you look back at, at U.S. policy over the last, you know, couple of decades, we've we've tended to favor innovation um, over regulation uh, in this balance. But I think that looking forward, um, at least as it relates to AI, um, Regulation doesn't necessarily need to get in the way of innovation. It's, it's kind of like um, invention is, is or ne, what is it? Necessity is is the mother of all invention. Um, I think if we start requiring companies to or models to do certain things, that could that could really incentivize companies to to start pursuing some of those things. Um, and I think that that's particularly relevant in AI because if you look at the where the cutting edge where cutting edge development is happening right now, um, it is mostly concentrated in these in a very small group of very powerful companies. Um, it's companies like Google, Microsoft, Meta, um, et cetera. And you know, these companies have a lot of capital on hand. Um, in implementing regulations would certainly introduce some kind of a burden. They would need to, you know, be maybe shifting the resources that they're devoting to, to different projects. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at Google specifically, I think Google spent more money on uh, share repurchases, uh, stock buybacks last year than the entire CHIPS Act will devote to domestic semiconductor manufacturing over its entire lifetime. So these are companies with a lot of money at their disposal. And having these kind of binding regulations might be actually the most effective way to fuel innovation in some of these areas around safety and responsibility um, that, that we want to see more, more development in. Um, and then I think just, I guess, yeah, that kind of gets to that macro point you made, Rita, where it's, um, I don't think we're necessarily putting ourselves at a disadvantage um, if we start regulating this technology. I think one thing that we definitely want to be aware of as we're doing it is that regulations um, will tend to favor incumbent actors. Um, so the companies that have the resources to comply with these regulations, the companies that have the resources to um, invest in R&D to, to implement new capabilities that help them meet the regulations. Um, 
smaller companies, startups that might be a little more challenging for them. So as we're implementing this, like that's definitely something we want to be thinking about. Got to balance attention. I just want to uh, kind of jump on to Jack's comments, which I think were great. And I look at it from a slight or a complementary to what Jack's laid out that especially in the military, we, we regulate the people. So the end users end up having a pretty significant regulation regime, but that's a good thing. It ends up enabling them. It teaches, a lot of it is qualifications based so that they understand the capabilities and limitations of the system. And once they understand that, they are a much more effective user and, and we get both responsible AI and just good application of AI. We have plenty of experiences in the military where we did not understand the tech uh, as well as we should have. And there were some pretty catastrophic mistakes. So I have no regrets about embracing regulations, especially on the end users within the military. And I think the military is pretty used to that. Thanks, Emmy. I'm going to use that as a segue to kind of push you a little bit to think even more broadly about what are some early lessons uh, and or insights that we can take from DOD's experience with investing in artificial intelligence and already early efforts to adopt artificial intelligence uh, for the broader U.S. innovation ecosystem for the commercial sector um, or just how we're thinking about investing in artificial intelligence writ large. What is the military getting right? What's the military getting right? Um, I mean, <laughs> first of all, you know, we can go back. Um, I, it makes me laugh that people are like, oh, you know, AI is really new. Computer vision is really new. And our Tomahawk weapons have had computer vision. It just, we didn't call it that back in the day. So the military has been working with AI systems, depending on how you define them, for a while. Um, what are we what are we getting right? Um, I mean, I think the coaching and preparing the operators who aren't necessarily they don't, you know, to Ali's point, they don't have PhDs in computer science. They are folks who are out in the field. I was just, you know, I was 26 the first time I had weapons release authority. So they're young, um, but we're able to teach them and prepare them and thinking a lot about how to prepare everybody to use these things wisely, I think is, is an important point. The other one that I often hear um, is, you know, this, this is a great technology, but we just have to figure out where it applies. Um, so there's ChatGPT and it's really fun to play with, but where are all the different places I'm actually going to use the thing? And the DOD focuses a lot on uh, concepts of operation. I think, frankly, they're still trying to sort out what all the concepts of operations with these new tools are going to be. Um, but, but the fact that they're pressing on, well, we've got the tool now, what exactly are we going to apply it on is, is another feature because it's very easy to get excited about how neat it is that I can sort of talk to my computer like it's a person. Um, but what exactly are we going to get out of that at the end is a, is a separate question. I actually wouldn't mind jumping in here really quickly just to, again, tout the, the power and benefits of prize competitions, right? So um, from 2010 to 2020, the DoD actually uh, facilitated the most uh, federal prize competitions. They did at least 113 that we know of. And one that I will point out that kind of speaks to some of these different areas that we're talking about. So starting in 2019, uh, the DoD's Naval Information Warfare Systems Command launched three competitions in a series aimed at improving cybersecurity. So in their first competition, they just solicited white papers, right? So just research ideas. And then in their second competition, they sought actual tools based on uh, white papers that were most promising. And so they sought these tools for for automated detection of advanced persistent threat uh, at the active or at the network level, excuse me. But then their final and most ambitious competition, which was the final in that three series, uh, they sought uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning enabled tools to automate security orchestration processes to enhance the, de the detection and prevention of APT activity, advanced persistent threats. Now, the total prize package for all three of those competitions totaled $1.3 million, and the Navy was authorized to award follow-on production contracts, which that really speaks to um, prize competition's ability to be structured to satisfy procurement requirements, which we know can often uh, be long and, and obscure. Um, and so the DoD is really taking prize competition seriously as a way to promote innovation, but also as a way to partner with some of those private sector entities that Jack mentioned that sometimes aren't keen to work with the Department of Defense. And so prize competitions are one way uh, to kind of bridge that gap. 
Thank you, Ali um, and Emmy. Thank you so much. So, Ali, while I have you, one of the things that Emmy said is that it's really important to understand that we're dealing with young people. Uh, that's in the context of the military, and that's true, and that's probably true in terms of technology innovation in general. But when it comes to AI, we're not just dealing with young people, we're dealing with kids. We're seeing that, you know, progress and uh, inventions like ChatGPT are trickling down to first graders that are already using it and perhaps even kindergartners. So while we're talking about, you know, talent development and the pipeline and workforce, where do we start? How do you think about AI education more broadly than just the PhD level? Yeah, that is a really good question. I, I saw a question in the chat about chat GPT and, and talent development, and that's a, a, a whole different story. But I will say that assessing the state of K through 12 AI education in the US has proven for me difficult. And, and one of the reasons why I find it difficult is because there are so many competing definitions and approaches to what AI education is, what it isn't, what is foundational AI education. Um, there's a lot of different approaches to that question alone. You know, you'll have, you'll ask some people who will say that foundational AI is, uh, is akin to AI literacy, right? Which is just understanding that when you're looking at your Netflix recommendations, there might be bias in that algorithm, right? Understanding how that might affect you personally. Then there are other camps of people that say, well, foundational AI is, is computer science and it's very firmly rooted in statistics. And so it's hard to kind of quantify what we're seeing in K through 12 AI education because there's so many different approaches. Um, but I will say that there are a lot of promising things happening. And so, there are, we are starting to see schools and states that are pioneering separate and standalone AI education pathways at the high school level. Um, and so they're doing this through a unique method of academic instruction called career technical education pathways. And those are just programs of uh, academic instruction that combine like typical academic coursework with like technical skills and knowledge for a future career. And so what's unique about CTE programs is they can be avenues into middle skill jobs that might not require a traditional bachelor's degree. Um, although previous CSET research does indicate that some of these non-traditional pathways for AI education, such as community colleges certifications are not always left leveraged effectively. But um, these CTE pathways are unique because they are preparing students more for that technical workforce that we're speaking to, not necessarily more for AI literacy. And so I think broadly speaking, some of the, the approaches to K through 12 AI education that we're seeing are skewed toward preparing a technical workforce, not necessarily AI literate one, um, but it's, it's, it is interesting to see the development of separate and standalone AI pathways come through this CTE method of instruction. But one positive takeaway though, is we do know that 50% of all US high schools offer at least one computer science class. And so we know 50% of uh, US schools are at least have some, some form of what we could consider foundational AI education for students. That's a really good start. I'm sure we have a long way to go, but it is, I mean, that's encouraging to hear already. I kind of want to shift gears a little bit and uh, go back to Jack and to something that you were talking about in the beginning when you were outlining, you know, American innovation, especially during the Cold War, was very much driven by the U.S. government and federal and state level investments in all sorts of initiatives. And we used to talk about industrial policy without being afraid or made uncomfortable by the concept. What is it that you think that has, you know, made industrial policy kind of a, pro, not, I don't want to say prohibited, but a bit of a taboo or a bit of a socially unacceptable topic of conversation um, over the past couple of decades? And how is the ideas around that are changing these days? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. I, I think that, um, if you look back, yeah, I mean, this was like the idea that the public sector plays a role in in shaping and 
and promoting and, and steering technological innovation um, is not a new idea. Like that was something that, that that U.S. policy really did adopt during you know during World War II and the years after World War II. Um, I think that part of the reason it fell out of fashion is is you know in the late '70s, early '80s, we started to see a shift kind of towards more. Um, I don't the word neoliberal economics has a has a bad connotation, but but more kind of like just just a general embrace of the free market um and and kind of these these more market driven approaches to um to to technological innovation. And um about the same time, if you if you look at if you look at US RD spending, um the US government was was the primary driver, the primary funder of of, of R D in the US. Um up until about that time, and then about 1980, 1981, we saw that we saw that shift towards the private sector, and then um, in the years since, the gap between the two has only grown. So I, I think if I remember the numbers specifically, but I, I think the private sector currently spends about um, or is responsible for about 70, 70 plus percent of of R and D funding in the U.S., and the government is responsible for about 19, 20 percent. Um, so there has been a there has been a big shift, and the private sector really is today kind of the epicenter uh, the epicenter of innovation. But um, and I think you know in in recent years industrial policy has had kind of a bad a bad connotation. Um, we saw some pretty high level examples of of, of failures. Um, Solyndra is kind of the classic one, um, but. I think what's what's interesting is that there's a lot of things that we we don't really have an issue with that are industrial policy. So like we have tariffs on imports of foreign cars and that benefits the US auto industry and like that is industrial policy. We have um you know a, a, a numerous uh price controls and and other economic controls on agriculture. That's industrial policy, but we are very comfortable with it. So I think that um What's changed in the last few years is just kind of this recognition, or it's kind of this this broadening of of what we consider to be industrial policy, and um, kind of just recognizing that you know a lot of the great great inventions that came out of like government R and D programs, like like R and D funding is is industrial policy, and this kind of like more expansive uh, definition of the word. Um, so I think that that's kind of been you know, and then we've seen a lot of country also other other countries, you know, China and Huawei being the classic example, like. Huawei became a global leader in telecommunications as a result of industrial policy, and it it kind of lost that lead in because of of, of U.S. procurement bans, and that, those could also be considered an example of industrial policy in the U.S. So I think I think it's just taking this more like broad based approach to what it could mean to to have industrial policy is is kind of shifting the conversation, um, and then just one thing that I'll add, kind of in this. Uh, in this more expansive view, uh, I think something that's been a little bit underexplored um, in terms of industrial policy are things that we could do to to stimulate um, more economic competition. Um, so yeah, antitrust is, is is very much in the news these days. There's been a lot. You know, Google just started the the big DOJ trial yesterday. Um, I don't want to weigh in on that, but I but I think you know if looking at looking at the way that markets are structured, um, they could either promote or inhibit innovation. Um, and I think just thinking a little bit more carefully about what kinds of what kinds of market structures and what kinds of factors contribute to innovation um, versus get in the way is pretty important. Thank you. That helps a lot to you know clarify what happened with that term, why we've been shying away from it, and why are we warming up to it once again? Uh, but thinking, you know, you said, how important it is to stimulate more of economic competition. And I, I think that is central to innovation in general. And I'm thinking an important missing piece oftentimes in this discussion of uh, emerging technologies and AI is the role of small businesses that are really, you know, in some ways are the cornerstone, uh, cornerstone of American economy. How do we think about the role of small businesses in the innovation and in emerging technologies, including in AI? And I know that the DOD has some initiatives to reach small businesses and to make sure that they are included in procurement efforts. Uh, so I kind of want to open that question to uh, Emmy and Jack and Ali, if you have thoughts, and I'll let you weigh in a bit on that. For sure. I, I love this question. Um, I think that the 
when it comes to small businesses, like we in, in innovation specifically, like there's a lot of benefits to small businesses in, in every sector of the economy. But if we're if we're looking specifically at kind of like technological innovation, this um idea that we have of like the Silicon Valley startup is, is kind of like the classic example of small business, right? You have you have a lot of you, you have new businesses forming in this very clustered geographic area. There's a lot of talent moving around. They're they're um, you know creating new products and they're they're succeeding and they're failing at a very rapid rate. And 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 I think that like the one the the, the, the big thing in innovation is that like a lot of innovation comes out of this kind of like novel recombination of different resources. So those are those are ideas. Those are people. Those are you know it's infrastructure. It's that kind of thing. Um, and st- and like small businesses are really like the the first the first place in which you see these novel recombinations happening and then from there you know when when something succeeds that business will grow it will become a little bit more entrenched and then like in theory you know a new small business will come around they'll come up with a better idea a better product and they'll overthrow the incumbent and that's kind of this this whole idea of like um i don't know this that that's how that's how economic competition works um so i think that I don't know if that totally answers your question, but but I think that that one thing that we could be doing, kind of taking that that idea of like innovation as capabilities and recombination into account is 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 thinking about ways that we can incentivize those that kind of turnover and that that novel sharing of of people and ideas. I think that when you when you look at like the talent conversation, um, there's there is a there is a big like a big real a big recognition at least that that you know movement of people between different industries and between different companies within those industries is really important to kind of generating new ideas, um, but we haven't always seen that come into play in in the way that we we I don't know do workforce development and that kind of thing. I, I think one there's one study that I, I really like that I'll point to is just. One of the one of the reasons, or you know, there are researchers who found that one of the reasons that Silicon Valley became um, an epicenter of innovation compared to Boston, which also has you know access to a lot of money, access to great schools, a, a, a thriving tech industry, um, is that California doesn't enforce non compete agreements. So you are able to see people move very quickly between these different companies without fear of legal repercussion, and like that enabled ideas to flow a little bit faster. Um, so that's one thing. I think another thing that we could think about um, in the years ahead is, is the um, the use of intellectual property and how those how those ideas get shared. Um, so one example that I like to point to is uh, in the '50s, you saw AT and T facing a um, antitrust suit from the government. Basically, came to an agreement where they would open up for licensing all of the IP that they generated within Bell Labs, and from there, like the transistor was was patented by was was in this ecosystem and then that went out into the world and you saw the semiconductor industry come out of it and you saw a lot of other like one a fun thing is like the answering machine was invented like many years before but AT&T never released it because they thought it would cut into the business so it's just there's a lot of like there's a lot of uh things that could both like patents they incentivize innovation because you get to reap the rewards when you invent something new but they also can get in the way when um you know those new ideas aren't being able to you, people can't iterate on them um kind of across the economy so i i know i kind of rambled a little bit there but i think there's a lot of different facets to this that are really interesting to explore no thank you those are all really good examples i mean i'm gonna come to you to ask what are you seeing some of the roles that small businesses can play in the dod innovation ecosystem and are we doing a good job in bringing them into the fold um so it's hard to say whether I'm, I'm sure they don't feel like we're doing a good job bringing them into the fold. And, you know, it never moves fast enough. Um, I will say that it seems like there has been an enormous shift and there's a lot more interest in investing in defense oriented or dual use kinds of startups that, that will have military applications as well as civilian. And what I see in some of what I think I see in, in the examples that I've come across is that. Um, the DOD ends up being an interesting place to test out ideas and to do really hard things to, to maybe change the way your product line might have been uh, planned originally. But whether or not it's your big high paying customer is still a separate question. Um, so it, it seems like DOD is fitting into this ecosystem of, of startups in, in an interesting way. 
And, and more than that, if we just go away from startups for a second, and we look at small businesses, small businesses are an enormously important part of the defense industrial base. You have the primes and we talk about them all the time, but a lot of what we need to get our job done is based in small businesses around the United States that do something really, really well. And we need it for the way we make our ships or the way we make missiles, whatever it may be. So um, it's I, I don't know if that completely answers your questions. I know everybody wants to talk about the startup and the venture capital realm because there's a lot of exciting things going on. But if we expand it to small businesses, we're looking at a, a really important factor for the defense industrial base. Yeah, and you know what? If I may jump in here too, again, to come off mute to tout the power and benefits of price competitions, right? So there's two things here that are kind of relevant to this question. So one of the benefits of, of hosting a prize competition is that it allows for a really diverse group of participants to submit ideas with mostly significant fewer bureaucratic imp impediments to participating or interacting with the federal government in this way. And so competitions typically do see a lot more participants from small to mid-sized businesses and a lot more academic participants as well. Um, but you mentioned SBA and that reminded me of um, how CIFR grants also can provide additional opportunities for small businesses to compete for federal investment um, with the potential for commercialization and can also be used as an additional incentive for participants. So I mentioned in my opening remarks that um, incentives don't have to be monetary, they can be non-monetary as well, or uh, incentives that can become monetary in the future. So an example of this is a few years ago, the US Army uh, ran a competition called its X-Tech Cyber Series. And this series welcomes submissions in a variety of, of topic areas uh, to address some capability gaps that the US Army identified and to accelerate prototype development. And so I think the, the typical SIPR process has three phases, the first of which typically requires participants to demonstrate technical merit and feasibility. And what was interesting about this X-Tech series though is that winners of this competition series were actually able to bypass that first SIBR phase and proceed directly to the second phase where contracts are awarded to help streamline and facilitate um, prototype development and procurement. Thank you, Allie. We can always count on you to bring in really detailed, specific. I do not know how do you remember this level of details about all of these programs. It's truly incredible. Uh, it does show you how passionate CSET uh, researchers are about our work. That's for sure. I think you know we're getting kind of towards uh, the concluding section of this really interesting and important webinar. And I want to give you the opportunity to hone down on if you had the chance to identify one thing that US policy makers should be really focusing on in order to improve US competitiveness, what would it be? Uh, if you know we're we're really passionate about our work and all of our projects, but if you had to pick one winner, uh, what would you convey to U.S. policymakers? Well, I'll go ahead and jump in. I think we all know what I'm going to say, um, but I, it's because I truly believe in the power of federally sponsored prize competitions. We've seen them uh, be successful. We've seen them. Um, incentivize innovation. We are seeing them now, like I mentioned in the strategic uh, or the, the updated strategic plan for AI R&D, we're seeing them being utilized and recognized by policymakers um, for their utility. And one thing I didn't mention, and I, I will mention now, this seems like the appropriate place, are what are all of the benefits, right? And so I think explaining the benefits of prize competition is a good way for me to um, in, endorse why I think this is something policymakers should know. So first, agencies are only paying for success, right? Which allows them or agencies uh, sponsoring offices, departments to set really ambitious goals because it shifts the risk of failure to participants. And if you um, very clearly and well, if you clearly define what success is, then you're only paying for participants that meet that really specific goal. Competitions also allow uh, the sponsoring agency or department to test for operational effectiveness prior to any major scaling, prototyping, or procurement decisions. And then uh, finally, all of this all of this can be done for typically a fraction of regular R&D costs. And so I'll end with this. 
We know that over the last decade, there's been at least roughly 800 some federal competitions. There are certainly more, um, but during this time period, the total prize purse for these 800 some competitions reached roughly $243 million. In comparison, total federal research and development outlays for the same period were about 1.3 trillion. And so you take all of those benefits into consideration, competitions are certainly a way to encourage innovation for really a fraction of the cost. Thank you, you make a really strong case. <laughs> I, I will jump on Ali's enthusiasm because I think you know her points about education are so important. Um, for the for the military, I guess this is somewhat the press competition. Let give the defense um, members of the defense the space and the flexibility and the resources to experiment. Let them start to get these tools out in the field with people who are in specific situations and have um, a, the fire of a particular concern start to find different ways to use it and get them used to using it. At the same time, we have got to arm them with the knowledge and understanding of what we mean when we say reliable, I'm sorry, when we say responsible or ethical AI. Um, if we don't give them that kind of an understanding, they will misuse it or they just won't really realize its full potential. And so the more policymakers can do to make sure that we're all in sync on these terms uh, domestically and we're educating the force on what we mean. And at the same time, linking up with our allies to make sure we've all got the same definition so that our definitions win the day and really set the international norms. That's the kind of thing that I think is foundational to running faster. Sure. And I'll just wrap it up by saying, um, it, kind of beating a dead horse at this point, but I, but I think it's just it's really important for federal policymakers to to examine the different levers that they have to enable like rapid turnover in businesses, sharing of talent, sharing of ideas. Look at ways that you can kind of create these more dynamic business ecosystems and and really um, kind of promote this idea of of creative destruction that 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 innovation really is based on where where you have you know newcomers coming in challenging incumbents creating new products improving over and over and over again and i think that that has historically been been a strength of ours um and uh we have a lot of tools at our disposal for doing so that i think have been uh underexplored so far thank you i'm really glad we had the opportunity to have this webinar because you know, we started this conversation by saying that there's a lot of emphasis and a lot of focus in trying to understand what can we do that is outward looking? What can we do to slow down China? What can we do to align better with our allies? What can we do, you know, to improve these different initiatives that we have that are essentially geared at efforts outside of our borders? But there is so much that we can and are already doing at home that is focused on talent, that is focused on investment, that is focused on the regulatory environment, and so much that we can learn from the Department of Defense uh, that, you know, acknowledging that there's still much to learn within the Department of itself, within the Department of Defense itself, of course, understanding that. But I think it's really useful to remember that there's a lot of incredibly inspiring initiatives. And if you wanna know more about them, make sure you contact Ali <laughs> that are really happening across all of these different sectors and that the United States is well on its way in investing in its infrastructure in its talent in its people, uh, in its workforce. Of course, there's more and a lot that we can be doing to strengthen those initiatives, but keeping track of these and monitoring how they're going, making sure that we're making the correct investments is really you know, something that CISA is committed to doing and something that I think we can all be doing a little bit more of. So I think as we're nearing our time here, I really wanna thank our participants for all of their really um, you know, insightful and inquisitive questions. I apologize if I haven't had the chance to reach all of them. Uh, we're nearing time, as I mentioned, and I'm sure uh, there will be continually more and more questions, both to the experts that we have here today and to other CSET experts. So I encourage you to keep uh, to keep up with some of our work that we have a lot of reports coming out uh, almost on a daily basis. And if you want to, you know, to keep track on what we're doing, you can learn more uh, on our website at csed.georgetown.edu. That will also give you an opportunity to sign up for our newsletter. 
And I just want to say again, thank you to uh, Ali, to Jack, and to Emmy for taking your lunch hour today and talking to us. And thank you again to the participants. I hope you have a really great day for the rest of your day today. And we will see you next time at another CSET event. Thank you.